Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this glorious occasion of the 14th annual Ballard Writers Collective Reading, which for the last couple of years, pandemic years, I might add, have been a crossover event with the It's About Time Writers Reading Series, which dates back to January 1990. I'm happy to announce that since Sunset Hill Community Association is very much open for business again, uh, we will probably be able to do a live event later in the year and reunite in person. But for tonight, we get to have people, I have no idea how many parts of the world Treya has invited. So <laughs> we have the opportunity to have many people across the United States and probably beyond join us tonight for this reading. The, uh, my side note message is do support the library as always and Sunset Hill Community Association and let them know how much we value these programs. They have been uh, a blessing throughout the pandemic, allowing us to uh, edit, record, place on YouTube. There were podcasts. And so I think our community has only grown. I believe it was in my Cancer Lifeline writing group some perhaps two months ago that uh, someone wrote and had the phrase, the language of the body. And that struck me as what I wanted to put out for the theme for tonight. And everyone tonight, uh, pretty much whether it was specifically for this evening or in their, you know, their zeitgeist or whatever, has addressed in some way that theme, the language of the body. Unfortunately, Ann Teplick, who was going to join us tonight, another longtime Ballard writer, is under the weather. And once it got to the coughing stage, she decided she'll have to pass. So our first reader tonight, going in reverse alphabetical order, is Lauren Simsky. Okay, Lauren is based now in an adorable seaside town close to New York City and miles of woods. She can organize your whole house, make a Yeti themed cake from scratch if you ask her to, and bruise her own kombucha. She's been writing since she was a child, and she writes in the margins of time, working super part-time, super part part-time, excuse me, on a collection of essays while working and raising two adorable girls. I can vouch for this. And she enjoys long walks on the beach and the beach, but not at the same time, never. So, so glad to have you actually in Washington State tonight. And I repeat, once a ballad writer, always a ballad writer. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you for being my consummate cheerleader for inviting me back. Um, I really enjoyed this. Um, so this piece is part of that series of essays that I'm hoping to assemble into a book one day. And this piece is called The Boxing Match. It was likely a Christmas present, the boxing gloves. They came as a set, a dad pair and a kid pair, brown and white with real laces that needed tightening. Nobody in our house cared for professional boxing, a short, painful season of t-ball, the extent of our family's team sport participation. We kids were happy to play with cheap plastic toys and watch TV. It was my parents who led us to the makeshift ring of our living room, who improvised the bells ding ding and told us to swing at one another. It would have been after dinner, after another one of their fights. These fights were never physical. Still, they possessed the might and heft of thunderclouds breaking over us, starting out as swirling bits of tension that built until it rained obscenities. My father leaning back in his chair, tie loosened, smoking, staring off into the distance. My mother, still pretty, even in a stained shirt, eyes locked on him, head lowered as if to charge. All of this happened across the kitchen table while we kids choked down broiled pork chops and watched in frightened silence. The bottle of wine my father had picked up on his way home from work would have been drained and their cigarettes lit. The opening salvos of their fights were always cool and level 
went nearly undetected by our ears already bruised by their collective tempers. By the end of the meal, they had ratcheted up into cruelty. My father would take a drag from his cigarette and avoid my mother's steely gaze. Bitch, he'd mutter under his breath. My mother buried her chin into her neck. I did the same. Who is nicer, me or your father, my mother would ask. I didn't think either of them was particularly nice, but depending on how much I'd been asked to clean that day or if my father had smacked my elbows off the table that night, I'd have my answer ready. My brother and I would huddle, sniffling around the parent we thought was most wounded or had maybe presented the most convincing case. We kids rearranged ourselves at either end of our kitchen table, wiping away our tears with paper napkins and glaring at our chosen enemy for the night. Whoever we deemed the most in need of comfort that night got our small bodies as collateral. Push, push, push. This was my mother telling me to force my hands inside the larger set of gloves. Keep pushing until you can feel the edge. I pushed my hands into the gloves, aimed at her chest until I was practically punching her. I was already in a fighter's stance, my whole body leaning into that glove. There, she sighed with satisfaction and squeezed my forearms. She smiled up at me and I quickly smiled back before I looked down, a little embarrassed at the clown-like shape of my hands. The living room was lit only by table lamps with pleated beige shades. The brown carpet disappeared into shadow at the edges of the room. The white lace curtains my mother washed and ironed a few times a year hung motionless in front of the heavy radiators along the wall. My mother braced herself against our corduroy couch as she tied me into the gloves. Someone had moved the coffee table out of the way. Both of my parents were smiling a little now, a little loosened up from the wine, having forgotten the transgressions apparently from the dinner table. After the dishes had been cleared, they'd guided us into the living room by our shoulders, told us to retrieve the set of gloves from the toy box on the porch. We happily did as we were told, relieved to get out of the kitchen and, find, and thrilled by the idea that we'd be extending our bedtime with a game. Now, she says calmly, clearing her throat, like this. Here she demonstrates a punch. She throws her fist in a straight line from her shoulder, snapping her fist back nearly as fast as she's thrown it out. She taps me lightly in the stomach, and though I'm not hurt, I still reel a little. Do it. Go on. Do it to me, she tells me. I awkwardly throw my fist toward her, and she swats my puffy glove out of the way. Again, she commands. I try again, faster this time, trying to imitate her speed. She slaps my fist out of the way. I can't, I moan. Come on, she commands fiercely. You can do it. There's no hesitation in her voice. No doubt. I am reassured by this. So I suck in my breath, and she lets me punch her in the chest. Good, she smiles. Just a few feet away, my brother is being readied by my father, who talks to him like a coach, cheerfully, encouragingly. Just remember, keep your guard up. Don't let her get in there. My brother nods his acknowledgement. They tell us to tap gloves. We do. We couldn't have been that different in size, my brother and I, though in my memory, I have made him extra small, an olive-skinned, tanned kiddo of about four, his hair bleached white by the sun, falling around his smiling face in a bowl cut. That would have made me six years old, my hands swimming inside a pair of adult boxing gloves. But that can't be true, can it? Maybe we are eight and six, maybe we are eight and ten. However old we are, we are pitted against one another. This kid who graciously allows me to line up his matchbox cars in size order because I think cars should be stored neatly in cases. This brother who lets me boss him around in our games of school and restaurant out on the covered porch. My brother who flings his body off the deck into the pool in crazy formations to make me laugh. My brother, who is already showing signs of a budding sensitivity to the world. He's being told to stand with his legs in a fighter's stance, to keep his knees bent, to keep his fists in front of his face. I'm supposed to hit him with all I've got. Now stand back, stand back, my father commands, suddenly sounding very official. He's on his knees, his palms on our chests, pushing my brother and me apart. As he scrambles into a comfortable position between us, I can see his black work socks have a hole in one toe. His brown dress pants are just a shade lighter than the carpet. His tie has been flung onto the couch and his shirt is open one more buttonhole. My mother is still smiling at us both, sitting on the floor with her legs folded gracefully beneath her, just a few feet away. 
Her skin glows with the kind of light I've seen around angels in my religion books at school. My brother looks both eager and nervous, his eyes wide. My father wraps his wedding ring twice against a lamp base. Fight. How long do we dance around each other in that living room? My mother yelling enthusiastically to throw a punch. My father yelling, keep your guard up before we finally make contact. We are tentative, my brother and me. Though we have spent the majority of our lives in close proximity to one another, playing endless games of pretend and setting up action figures and battle postures, we're suddenly not sure where to put ourselves in relation to one another. My brother lands the first blow with a startling thwack against my upper arm. The leather feels cool and sticks to my skin slightly as he pulls his arm back into position. I feel the layers of cotton batting beneath the surface of the glove, so it doesn't feel unlike being hit with a small pillow. It is strange to be struck, to be hit intentionally this way. A familiar perfectionism floods my body. I correct my posture at my mother's urging. I hold my gloves in front of my face. This is just like school, I decide. I am good at school, an A student. I want, with a sudden fiery passion, to win. I throw a sloppy punch and it pushes my brother back. I watch him wince, then recover. A flash of frustration clouds his face, then evaporates immediately. I can sense my parents' impatience with us. My mother is telling me to do something now, to hurry up. So I suck in my breath and swing out in a big C, hitting my brother on his back. I am suddenly aware of his geometry. This is a rib cage. This is a jaw. This force, this precision feels somehow revelatory, like I'm learning about the size of the universe for the first time. My brother lands a few more punches around my head. I swing, but don't make contact. My brother has obviously understood his imperative to defend because I can hardly see his face through his gloves. I decide then that the only way to survive this, to maybe even win this, is to soften my gaze, to let my vision go fuzzy around the edges, and to let this animal energy rising in my gut to just have its way with my arms. Soon we are aiming for each other's soft stomachs, cheeks, ribs. We are huffing and puffing with the effort, sweat forming on our brows. My mother's voice has gone from encouraging to a fevered pitch, egging me on, telling me to keep going, keep going, get him, get him. My brother seems to be holding back. My father repeats to my brother inches from his face and with rising anger to keep it up. The more we dance around one another, the more I am filled with euphoria, confidence. I can take this, I decide. I can keep standing, even though someone wants to knock me down. It's not that hard even. Just tense up, dodge, swing. My brother cowers, covers his face, and I pummel him. I am numb as I windmill my arms in front of me closing my eyes so I can't see where I'm hitting him. I don't want to hurt him, but I don't want to be hurt either. He curls tighter, then springs forward at me when I rest a moment, and I can taste the leather of his boxing gloves in my mouth, can feel his tiny, powerful fists inside those gloves against my temple, my shoulders. I am shocked by his strength. Now each subsequent punch hurts. I must be staggering a little, and he must see this because he lays off for a few seconds. My mother yells, one, two, give him the old one, two. Tighten up, my father yells at my brother, fall back. We do the best we can to interpret them, taking a step backwards each, holding our gloves even closer together. My brother lands a few more punches and my skin is starting to sting. The pain causes my body to swell with something mean and dangerous. A mounting anger I don't recognize, and now I hit back harder and harder. I can sense all things around me and nothing in front of me. I can hear my mother's voice encouraging, come on, come on, keep swinging, that's it, you got it. My mother pounds the floor with her palms, her voice starting to go hoarse. I'm crying now, the tears blurring my brother before me. My body aches, but more painful is the idea that I might lose, that I might disappoint my mother. I'm sure my brother is crying too. The tears make me feel ashamed and weak, so I blink those feelings into nothingness and into the void of my body rushes a billowing pride, the pride of winning. I so, so want to make my mother proud of me. I am blind, punching through squinted eyes, stiff and imprecise, pushing my brother further into the shadows of the room, 
He is not my brother anymore, just a shape I should charge with all my might. After all, he wants to punch me, so I have to get him first, don't I? Shouldn't I? I want to make her proud, my mother. Want her to see I am strong, that I punch hard even though I'm a girl. I want to win. I don't care who my opponent is. I want her to win. She should win. She deserves to win. She deserves to not be sad and angry all the time. She's not a bitch, like my father says. She's a good mom. She is so strong, my mother, and so am I. I am so lucky to have a mom who will cheer me on. I will win for both of us. I am swinging, sweating, grunting, leaning into my punches with gritted teeth. My mother cheers, my brother swings, retreats, and swings again. My father yells to keep it up, keep it up. The room gets hotter and the brown of the carpet and gloves become one level field, broken only by the flash of my brother's eyes and the whites of the laces. I don't know how long we last like this, just that we are spent when we are done, all four of us. Do I have a memory of hearing him say eventually, I can't or I don't want to anymore in a weakened voice? Or is he punching with all his might all the way to the end, desperate to make his father proud? I know we eventually collapse to the floor, sweating, peeling our clothes away from our soaked bodies. Do we tap gloves companionably and say, like the cartoon characters we've watched, good fight, good fight? My mother and father will laugh and clap, smiling broadly at this good old fashioned fun we're having, comforting the loser, telling us we'll win next time. I know we act out this scene many times in the weeks and months to come. Every time our parents coach us from the corners after a fight and a bottle of wine, raising our limp hands above our heads in victory when we are through. Every time I feel like I am betraying my brother. But that feeling lasts less and less each time we box, replaced by an urgent need to dominate and win, to grind him out with an untroubled rage that has taken up a comfortable residency in my body. Harder and faster than my brother's gloved hands come at my solar plexus, plexus will come his confusion, his determination, my father's frustrations, and my mother's wild, scrappy grit. All of that will hit me between the actual blows from my brother. All of it will sting my eyes, cloud my vision, cause the edge of my memory to go fuzzy. It will be the first time I can remember feeling everyone's feelings in the room. The first time I will take on someone else's sadness and rage and wear it like a champion fighter's robe before the match. I will feel it all, my mother's ecstasy, my father's weighty, impossible expectation, our combined bewilderment at the instruction to hurt one another, and then how easily we follow it. How's that for a lead off, everybody? <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Lauren and I, we talked earlier today and after Anne left off, for those of you who are thinking, wait a minute, I thought it was only supposed to be like four minutes. Lauren and I uh, talked and I gave her permission to, to go with this longer piece as our lead off and well worth it. Thank you so much for the work you're doing and keep on it with those essays. I will never stop being your cheerleader. Thank you, Peggy. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. We switch gears. Carol Levin, you're next in our alphabetical order. There's Carol up the street, still with a skeleton. So Carol, her brief bio says, it's been great. Dancer, actor, employment manager, radio DJ, integrative examiner technique teacher, poet, dog walker, neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> All amazing, wonderful things. So welcome, Carol. I left off 20 years. Yeah, you left off in, in in the opera, Seattle opera. Super How could numerous. I have forgotten? <laughs> Supernumerary. I thought it was under actor and also a reigning poet of Sunset Hill. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, this is uh, a, a change here. <laughs> um, I have three poems. Liberated from the onus of ennui. No two people have ears 
exactly the same shape an art teacher taught years ago. Freed from absolutes, I live moment to moment as flamingo pink, blasphemy gray, wild hunter green, and best of all, irresistible cerise, a bit bluer than a cooked cherry. Dancing in pellicid floral white, where wind lifts my go for it all, I'm a rascal, a potentate, a mother of pearl, albatross in a fishbowl, hear lyrics in a different way. I'm air, and I am gravity. Each have their job in tension between what has happened and what is possible. Contributing to my insight was an acrobatic plane ride with a certain hurdy-gurdy player named Teddy. The paradox of feeling utterly mortified, fearful, and completely hilarious during barrel rolls, loops, and especially the nose spin, as his thoughts were as unknown as a Monday museum, creating the equivalent of what I feel that no one else can feel, that each of us is everywhere, and everywhere we are is this moment's shape of language. Angel studies core coordination in class. The day the class drew their skeletons, I didn't see Angel Anne's sketch, but my guess, it looked small, like a child's first stick figure, arms stuck in ears. She worked hard holding herself intact, said she was jointed double. Supporting a halo at her day job, her knuckles convulsed into claws, feeling tied down in order to indulge divinity. But she hung in at class, noticed her thinking, and stopped tightening her head to her spine. Then I swear, surprised, she sprouted shoulders, ushered in ease in her hips, and unfurling her fingers, she flew, she flew. Last one. Time. And there's an epigraph. In the morning, I said, I love you. And he said, I know. Common for people to be very calm hours before they let go of life. Others thrash beds, speak to aggravators in their mind, kick away the outcome of time. Astonished to arrive at 95, 95, he kept repeating meaning implausible. Sneaking up, he nipped time in the bud 
thought his steady grip carried out a coup. What's 95, he whispered. 95. Contorting, tossing, and throbbing that morning, pain thrashing into mumbly semi-sleep in the shaded silence of late afternoon, leading eventually into serene slumber. I was holding his hand, hours looking after his inspiration and exhalation, still in sleep, I think, without opening his eyes. I didn't know then it would be the very last words ever. When, with authority, he said, wind the clock, wind the clock. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I was on the edge of my seat for the one. <laughs> Thank you for taking us and, you know, getting, taking us to, to Geo's side as well. Thank you. I miss you both sitting in front and, you know, the sitting always in front at the front row at the Ballard Library for the reading. So. Yeah. I uh, know. Thank you. I'm glad you were able to join us tonight. Thank you. Okay, now from the northern parts of Ballard, <laughs> we welcome Sheila Kelly. Sheila. Sheila Kelly moved to the neighborhood in 1981 and writes about Alaska, the environment, and camping while old, also known as the lamp gramping. I always call gramping. it gramping. Right. Not gramping. Gramping. She's a she is so not a glamper. She is such a gramper. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. So um I struggled with this. I am so I'm approaching this in a different way. When the topic language of the body. I went to immediately, this is the body that I'm most interested in here, having been an environmentalist for years. So the body, which is the planet Earth. And um, I have worked, all I'm gonna give you really is the outline of what I have been struggling with. And then uh, probably, less time, leave more time for somebody else. But I chose the earth as the body of interest and thinking in terms about what is the language of this body. And I have, you know, a three day workshop on this, but for three minutes, uh, I didn't get it down to that. So there I am admitting my failure at this. So questions that I, put out and work with how can the earth speak and how does it speak to us? What is the language of the earth? And are we hearing its messages? Do we believe its message? And who interprets what the earth is saying? There are scientists and religious leaders and uh, art artists and uh, everybody has a different vocabulary for explaining what the earth is saying. And I believe it's a challenge and for all of us to be listening to it and what do we do with it? So I would offer those questions for you to you to think in terms of what it means to you and your, how you are in the earth, on the earth, and um, then it, some of the things that came that I had sections on here that are lost in my computer um, are the, um, 
I say what the scientists have to say, lots of factoids and all of facts and the uh, con contradictory facts. So, but what I got to, I mean, my staying with something like this, where I get down to what's there is I end up with a Mary Oliver poem, you know, because I believe that the earth has a soul and that many of the things that we are dealing with in the language uh, have to do with discovering of it or ignoring it. So um, I'm actually going to take Mary Oliver's words and use them to do a closing and turn over my time to somebody who has more that they want to say and you have to come back when I have my three-day workshop on all of this but if because different definitions for the earth have changed uh, and now we are looking at not only is it a like the Gaia uh, theory told us about it's a living organism and uh, it has rights there are uh, cases that have been determined that natural objects have rights and so Mary Oliver takes it a stage farther and to me that's what's significant in looking at this language of the earth is um, so I'm going to just use her here about some questions, you probably know this poem, some questions you might ask about does the earth have a soul? So, and is the soul solid like iron or is it tender and breakable like the wings of a moth and the beak of the owl? And here's the main one, who has it and who doesn't? I keep looking around me. The face of the moose is as sad as the face of Jesus. The swan opens her white wings slowly. In the fall, the black bear carries leaves into the darkness. One question leads to another. Does the soul, does it have a shape like an iceberg, like the eye of a hummingbird? Does it have one lung like the snake and the scallop? Why should I have it and not the anteater who loves her children? Why should I have it and not the camel? Come to think about it. What about the maple trees? What about the blue iris? What about all the little stones sitting alone in the moonlight? What about roses and lemons and their shining leaves? What about the grass? So I will continue to draw on this to put it in my own what distillation, because having worked as an environmentalist for 50 some years, that and how what I owe to the planet and what my what the opportunities and the responsibilities are. And um, next year, I'll have a better resolution on this. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. When is your workshop, your three-day workshop? <laughs> I'm just saying that's what I'm prepared for that. I've done enough okay. research All right. all, and I have enough there. When I first picked this thing idea, even though I know it was a little off center as far as when you were talking about language of the body, I didn't think you were asking for something about the planet Earth, but I got totally intrigued and possessed by it and and it led to so many scientific and uh, you know spiritual questions and all so um i just uh, i live with it perfect i'm glad and thank you for reminding us that the earth has a soul so we'll look forward to further enlightenment next year thank you all right, our next reader is Treya Maria, or it is Maria, I was like going, Treya Maria Berlenza. 
who uh, always responds to, you know, she knew that this prompt was absolutely, this theme was absolutely meant for her. So, hello. Okay, we, we can hear you now. Trey right. explores through her writing the juxtaposition of the spiritual and the material. Welcome, Treya. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I was inspired by this theme, and um, my piece is called In and Through the Body, and it's an album title from Trevor Hall. Can I help you take off your shoes? The technician asked thoughtfully. Yes, that would be great. I smile and lean against the gurney. As she removes my shoes, she asks, do you need help getting up? I think I'll be all right. Just stay close and spot me. She offers me her arm and I push up and slide on. Easy peasy, she kind of sings her response. Would you like a warm blanket? My face lights up and there's no need to answer. She's already off to get it. As she tucks me in, she asks, would you like another? That's the only reason I came here. I chuckle, and she is off again. Have you ever had an MRI, she asks. Yes, several. Okay, so you know what to expect? You're not claustrophobic? No, I say, and I feel myself cringe a little. It's loud in there. Do you want music? Can I choose, I ask. Yes, she smiles. What would you like? Trevor Hall. Trevor, H-A-L-L. -L. I repeat enthusiastically. She wheels me into another room where a large white tube sucks me in with abrupt starts and stops. As I'm entering the tunnel, she hands me a squishy ball on a long cord. Squeeze this if you need me. As I enter the belly of the beast, I look past my feet toward the faraway opening at the other end. I close my eyes and I breathe into my belly. Are you ready? Her all pervasive voice asks calmly. Yes, I say. Click, bang, bang, vibrate and shake. Click, bang, bang, vibrate and shake goes the big tube. I can start to hear Trevor Hall's soothing voice climb above the cacophony of sound. I bring my attention back to my breathing into my belly. Long inhalation, longer exhalation. Thoughts appear in my mind. The character of their content is as loud and obnoxious as the sound I'm experiencing. Boom, bang. I don't want any more problems. Isn't having a less enough? Rattle, rattle, shake. What if I need spinal surgery? Wheelchair, wheelchair, wheelchair. No fucking way, please. Deafening silence. My love is just a reminder, find your center. Where the hell did that come from, I think? Trevor's voice is inserting itself between and above the forceful sound mass. My love is just a reminder. Find your center. My love is just a reminder. Find your center. Find your center. Does he really repeat that line so many times? 
my body starts to giggle. Long, slow inhalation. Longer, slower exhalation. I sense my body weight fall into the hard metal surface beneath me. Spontaneously, my body and mind let go. How are you gonna get free this time? Falling into a blue sky mind in and through the body. The next song washes over me. I feel Trevor's words and the song of the MRI move in me, move through me. My body, heavy, light, empty, expanded. I'm floating in this huge plastic tube, spinning, turning. No center, no form, just sound and sensation swirling. It's freeing, blissful. I don't want it to end. I'm beyond the worries of the body-mind, in the exquisite space of nothingness, beyond, beyond. The technician's omnipresent voice makes another appearance. I really like this artist. Thank you for turning me on to him. I feel the corners of my mouth curl upward. The universe winks. Even as uh, there you, are no drugs involved in this. No drugs. Drug. No, even it's as drug. you said that your mouth curled upward, my mouth was curling upward. And I bet if I could see more people in the gallery, that would be true of all of us. And the universe winks. Thank you, Treya. Thank you for inviting so many of your friends and family tonight. We Thank love you for everyone coming. Oh, thank you, Peggy. Oh, it's a pleasure. Oh, thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, Laura Hirschfield, say hello. Don't be nervous. <laughs> hello, thank you for having me. So good to see you. I, you know, I knew Laura from some years ago and we ran into each other at a reading at Huga House. So uh, she is a therapist in Seattle and a recent empty nester who tends to write short prose poemy pieces that blend fact and fiction. Sounds perfect. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I was, yeah, inspired by the theme. Um, Okay, uh, this is a, a short piece. It's called After the Call, The Waiting. I begin researching wigs. No, wings, types my dear friend autocorrect, as if she'd been waiting all day for us to begin. As if to say, fly away, old wispy hair, lift and alight upon a nest, upon a limb. Who knew a wing to be so many things? I mean, I knew, but I didn't. I hadn't thought to put them together all at once, all the wings, the feathered thing, the area at the side of a stage out of sight, the side piece at the top of an armchair, the woody expansion of a plant along its stem, the vein of a windmill or arrow, an outlying region or district, a dance step marked by quick outward and inward glides, a unit of the US Air Force, higher than a group and lower than a division, one of two lateral petals of a pap papillionaceous flower. She was told to bring a favorite summer tank top to the port insertion appointment so the doctor could place it under or near the straps. I wonder when she wore a tank top last. When did I, as if, oh, the shame of a healthy body. Oh, how rarely we think of it that way. To wing is to fly or improvise or wound of Scandinavian or Sanskrit origin, meaning it blows. If all goes according to plan, she will have six rounds of chemo. She will lose her hair within the first three weeks. She will be very tired. 
Her bones might ache and her toes twitch, her red painted toes already twisted and buckled at the knuckles, no longer able to stay in their orderly row. Class, sit down where you belong, feet on the floor, hands in laps. She will have other drugs as well. This is the land of the unwell, as Sontag or Hitchens or someone or even masses of people have said. Sometimes they do this, the masses, the doctor said, meaning cells transform unexpectedly, like seedlings, rooting and vining. To wig is to scold severely, to lose one's composure or reason, to freak, usually without, short for periwig from the French, and not to be confused with perimenopause, a common cause of hair loss, perineum, usually hairless, or periwinkle from the Middle English, to bind or entwine. Yes, it blows. I mean her hair. I mean her lips. I mean the unnamed vocalizations we each make over the phone before or after we hang up. Thank you. Thank you. You know, while Treya was reading, I was reading the closed captions and they do that auto correction so much. And so your piece already just took me so many places. When Treya said that she, the, the, the person who was doing her um, MRI offered me her arm, it said orphans me her arm. And so your flight of fancy with wing and wig and that language, you know, around the body, et cetera, is so perfect as a follow-up to that. Although I would hate to think what the uh, closed captions did to your reading. So <laughs> I'm so glad that it spoke to you and that you have come back to, to finally let us hear you at Ballard Writers. So thank you. Great to have you here. Please come back again. Okay, Alexandra Dane is next up. So Alexandra, say hello. Hi. Hi, okay. Uh, let's see my little thing here. Alexandra, uh, her, her, what, you know, speaking, with a, a bio that speaks already to the body, explores what lies deep in the marrow of our bones. Published in Liberty, Bellingham Review, San Adele Press, and her essays and blog explore the tiny big things that happen, even drop stitches. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for organizing this. And it's nice to see so many little squares of people. Um, I had no problem with knowing what I was going to write about, uh, and my piece uh, is titled The Memory of Pleasure. My mouth might be full of sand. I inhale through my nose, resist the urge to spit. You love this? You love this. You will love this again, I cheer myself on silently, washing the offensive texture down with a gulp of tea. Every day my body and I must rediscover how to talk since struck with COVID-19. The communication path between my tongue, nose, and brain was broken 18 months ago after three weeks of quarantine. I describe it like this. A piece of food registers through my mouth, not unlike a chemical reaction. Sugar is cloying, salt is dry, Spicy is a feeling of heat. There is no additional depth, layer, or nuance. Flavor, as you know it. So a one-dimensional physical interpretation from my brain just sends the message, yuck. No amount of sniffing, sipping, chewing, or time changes the zero taste. Vegetables suddenly became landmines. Landmines. Cabbage, bark light. Avocado, slimy. Beloved cauliflower, uncomfortably craggy. Potatoes might as well be made of glue. Meat felt like I was gnawing on my thumb. Forget slippery fish. I missed looking at food and salivating. My favorite dessert, 
fresh blackberry ice cream was now just uncomfortably cold. Scents I love were oddly translated. A fresh summer day smells like burnt coffee. My favorite perfume warm for decades smells like cleaning fluid and burns my nose. This will pass, the experts assured me the first months, examining x-rays and CAT scans and putting cameras up my sinuses. But like me, they had no post-COVID-19 vocabulary. There was a lot of shrugging, second opinions, more testing, and finally, they just sent me home. My relationship with the kitchen devolved quickly. I ate comfort food, things my brain didn't have to think hard about, pastas, cheese and crackers, bread, filling, food, no scent, minimum time in my mouth. The physical kitchen itself was a place of danger. I can't smell smoke. So after incinerating three tea kettles and setting off countless smoke detectors, I had to make a firm agreement with myself to never leave a room when I'm cooking, even boiling water. And without a sense of smell, I also lost my culinary calibration abilities. My once super keen olfactory nerves could no longer be relied on to tell me when a baked cake had perfectly risen, fruit jam was ready to stir, roast chicken had reached the perfect degree of crisp. A year into this disorienting relationship with my body, an annual physical revealed that there were more consequences. My blood work in the scale revealed high cholesterol, high blood pressure, eight pounds. Taking the easy way out to deal with this sensory interruption had not been the answer. I went back to the kitchen and began again, using my memory of what used to be healthful and flavorful. Reoriented my brain, not in a day, mind you, to block the messages sent from my nose and mouth, leaned heavily on the other senses, sight, touch, sound, to enjoy food. When nothing appeals to me, I go for bright, multi-level salads, simple protein, berries that roll in my mouth. I stay put in the kitchen with a book when a cake is in the oven and listen to the timer, not my nose. I make risotto to enjoy the sound of a slow, steady simmer. I still instinctively lean over and inhale the steam rising from a simmering pot of chicken soup. Lift a branch of lilacs to my nose and breathe deep. Rub my cheek against new baby skin. My body remembers what I love. Now I say things differently like, the air is so fresh on my face today, or this is the silkiest, creamiest pudding. Pleasure is stored deep in my 60-year-old body. I just have to listen. Last week, I took tea outside to admire the last of the summer roses, felt the cold air in my mouth, dunked a cookie in my tea to soften the crumb brushed a spider web off the soft, velvety petals of a favorite rose, closed my eyes, and remembered the joy of her sweet, perfect perfume. That was lovely. I was hoping for a happier ending, though, but it was beautiful. And I'm certainly sorry that it was so easy to find your way to this theme. The last time I read for you, I read about baking. You did. You did. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you have not stopped baking. And Jennifer gave me a, a cookbook recommendation. And I mean, I was like, oh, my God, the irony of this. Oh, well, here we are. Still standing. Yeah. And but it's about the beauty in a way. So, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you were here with us tonight. All right, the last of our scheduled readers is Jay Craig, who I believe has never missed a Ballard uh, Writers Collective reading. And then we will have time for some open mics. So Jay, give us a, give us a hello. How's, hello. Okay. <laughs> Jay's second book, Brave Liver, A Bipolar Guide to Working in Seattle, came out earlier this year. And he is currently working on his next book, Cold. The Scottish Buddhist Guide to Alaska. Welcome. I never yeah. know what he's going to bring to us, so it will be a surprise to everyone in attendance. All right. Well, um, 
so yeah, the uh, if anybody's keeping track, I've got a, a new job. Um, I'm not driving a monorail anymore. I uh, got a job on a whale watching boat, but that season's over. So now I'm on the, the Victoria Clipper uh, going up to Victoria, BC. Uh, I love it. Uh, one of the perks is that we get to go uh anywhere that alaska airline flies for 42 dollars, so uh which is fantastic so that's why my next book is going to be a guide to alaska i'm going to go explore uh juno and sitka and ketchikan and and e everywhere so uh looking forward to that and now i got a reason for it to, to write a book right but uh i love it it's uh it's great the customers are pretty funny uh the other day i went into comfort class to get a latte and this lady and her husband walk by me and the wife goes into the bathroom while her husband stands outside the door. I'm her bodyguard, he told me. I have to stand outside bathrooms to make sure nobody walks in on her. Cool, I said. Have you seen the salmon jumping? Those are the Chinooks. Those suckers get this big, I said, indicating with my hands how big a 60 to 80 pound fish is. I try not to swear when I'm giving tours or talking to passengers, but a Chinook salmon, especially compared to a sockeye or coho, is freaking huge. I also try not to mansplain things, but that's just how an ex tour guide talks. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It also doesn't matter if I'm giving a tour or just randomly talking to a dude whose wife is in the bathroom. I saw my opening to explain the life cycle of a Pacific Northwest salmon, so I took it. Really, that's wild, he said. Tell me more. That's really fascinating. Or something like that. I don't remember exactly how he said it, because just then some dude walks up, opens up the bathroom door in front of all the comfort class passengers who had turned around to hear me talking about salmon that were jumping right outside the boat. <laughs> the wife screams at the top of her lungs, getting the attention of every other person who wasn't listening to me talk about where, where Chinook salmon goes to spawn. The dude slammed the door and left the cabin, and I expect that's what the husband wanted to do too, but instead he just closed his eyes and said, I am so screwed. She came out of the head a little bit later and immediately started yelling at him. Any embarrassment or shyness completely replaced by rage. How could you do that to me? You promised you stand in front of the door. Well, you still have to lock it. Who doesn't lock a door if they're so worried about somebody opening it? That's crazy. You know I have a fear of being locked in bathrooms. What's wrong with you? All I ask is that you stand in front of the door and instead you're talking about a goddamn fish. Jesus, Harold. God damn it. Look, Harold said, you can't have two phobias about this. Do you want to be afraid of being locked in a bathroom or somebody opening the door on you in front of a boatload of people? You got to pick one in that. You can't have both. You can't pick your phobias, Harold. That's not how it works, she yelled as they got back to their seat. God damn it. What is wrong with you? And she's right. You can't pick your, phobia, your phobias any more than you can pick your mental disorders. Given the choice, I probably would have gone with Tourette syndrome over bipolar disorder because at least then you can call somebody a silly cocksucker over and over again and get away with it. So here I am, stuck with my manic depression, for better and worse, and I've come up with a few strategies that I compiled in my book, Brave Liver, a bipolar guide to working in Seattle that I'd like to share. Take a shower as soon as you get up. Don't think about it. Don't debate it with yourself. Just do it. Depression stinks and other people can sleep. Make the bed as soon as you get up. Your depression wants you to get back to sleep. Making the bed first thing in the morning is your first accomplishment and a powerful statement that you're ready to get out there and do it for what do the dishes before you go to bed. There's nothing like a pile of dirty dishes to make you not want to do anything. No more drunken manic emails to your bosses at three o'clock in the morning. That only works if they're also drunken manic at 3 a.m., which they usually never are. Take your lithium every day and don't ever go off it again. And always be nice, take care of yourself, and try to have fun. Brave Liver, a, bi a bipolar guide to working in Seattle, is available at select retailers. So that counts as my book launch. <laughs> I wasn't going to do a book launch, but there it is. So the, that's the book launch now that like, you know, helps it get like, you know, future for culture funding, I hope, right? Uh, I, yeah, I don't... you did your book launch. That's great. Oh. And um, Jay is also collecting books by Seattle writers to have on a new uh, shelf on the Victoria Clipper. So if anybody would like to donate any books, some of you already have, uh, he is trying to, well, what would you say? What is your goal for putting books well, on the Victoria Clipper? Um, I want to get, uh, I think it's a great place. So, so I met this uh, this woman who uh, 
she did a book. She she was on the Clippers. She did a book. Uh, her name is Margaret Wilson, and she did a book. Uh, she she did a reading also about it at the uh, Nordic Museum, um, about like this uh, uh, this 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 woman uh, f- fishing captain from Iceland in like eighteen hundred, right? And uh, so I met her and talked to her and uh, talking about how you know it would be great to have her you know come on and and like have uh some of her fans her readers come on and, and just kind of meet her without the pressure of doing a reading or whatever so what i'd like to do is get uh, a bunch of books on there from seattle writers i have already started um and then uh if people want to do some kind of like little event going up to victoria just hang out i mean it's uh there's a lot of there's no internet on there on, uh on the on the boat so there's people bring books and sometimes they don't bring a book and they forget it or whatever. So I have all these books out there from Seattle writers. So we already have a question in the chat for you, Jay, where can Seattle writers bring these books? Uh, get them to me or drop them off maybe at Peggy's house or something. And um, I'm getting some little stickers made right now. So, so that, you know, the, the clipper with Seattle writer that I'm going to put on there on all the books. Um, and uh yeah, I'll we'll just get them on there. Yeah, we may be able to uh, arrange a more coordinated um, drop spot. All right. No, I think it's a great idea. Jay has been one of the greatest promoters of Ballard Writers Collective and all things Seattle and Seattle writers uh, in all of his jobs, including short stories on Metro buses, a book rack at the monorail, uh I can't even list all the places that you promote us because I cannot list all your jobs. Yeah. And I would also like to add that his, uh, what would you call it? Sort of a collage of Ballard signage is the backdrop for the poetry box uh, that is now in front of the Sunset Hill Green Market and poetry books are also always a welcome contribution. Okay, so now we have uh, heard from two people who would like to do open mic, including one of the people who is an incredible also promoter of writing in Seattle, one of the greatest, Priscilla Long. Would you like to do uh, open mic? Thanks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and um, I was going to read a new poem, but since it's body poem time, I thought I would read body poem. After death, the writer's body inhabits the body of work. The eye remains, the hand everywhere in notebooks, the heart in beat and rasp of poem. Voice, breast, breath, the intricate vulva devolving into throb, blood hot or not. The naked foot, dancing, leaping, all in the body of work. Thanks. I was thinking about, you know, body too, as you know, the body and the body of work. So thank you. Okay. Mary Ellen Talley, would you like to unmute and do your open mic? Okay. Thank you. And uh, Priscilla, you persuaded me to get something on the body. <laughs> <laughs> and also because um, there have been mention of MRI and um, chemo. So I thought I'd do this one I wrote for a friend. Thanks. Inspired by William S. Merwin. Thanks. The word sung, surge, then undone when sorrow ushers in a harrowing forgiveness, thanks. We give it remains ours to give. Full measure is still measured like a dram inside a thimble full of dare you call it hope. The bird that takes to winging across the lake to find shadow and heat, sun in the chill strewn air. Thanks and thanks again, even if try as we might, we can no longer put shoulder to the boulder 
as our right arm seems to be leading the dull ox of resistance. Even so, still we mutter thanks, knowing such repercussions cross the path as we ride the bicycle, no hands to the snack shack for an ice cream cone slathered with nuts, choose a drumstick, peel the paper slowly around the cone and nibble on a bench while your bike rests on the grass. Thanks is, was all the memories kept in a wire handlebar basket. Thanks, even though fenders that keep mud from splattering on your back only come now as separate add-ons. Thanks for the chocolate smile. Thanks for the free napkin in a dispenser on the counter near the cash register. Thanks for the sisters, brothers, friends, daughters, sons, grandchildren, all the bright-eyed commitments, our God charms, even when rain forgets to soothe the dry dusk, dust darkening the shiny side of green leaves. Thank you. One continual thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, it reminds me, you know, today we would have been joined by Alice Krupnik, but a long, another longtime Ballard writer. But unfortunately, as she put it, she became one of the eight women who, who will be diagnosed with breast cancer recently and was having her surgery today. So, um, but she shared with us like an incredible early piece that she had been reading that I believe had to do with like, what is it? An unexceptional cervix and ordinary breasts neither of which unfortunately have proven to be true. So our next, we have another open mic person, just a one who's flushing out a stanza, as they say, Marta Sanchez. Marta. Thank you. Um, did I do it right? <laughs> Can you hear me? We hear you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for listening. This has been a wonderful reading. I finally actually made it, Peggy, to one of these. <laughs> Okay, here's my stance. Sorry for giggling. I've been doing that a lot lately. Uh, my brain has no gender. My heart isn't chasing anyone, regardless of parentage. My mind, the bandits, a treachery, and deconstructs. Colin, colon, this. Okay, and that's it. And thank you for listening to that. I have no idea how I'm going to work that out, but I needed to hear it amongst poet people. I like how you put that. It was so nice to have uh, Je Jennifer. I always call Jennifer D. Monroe because I go by people's emails here tonight and to have seen her in person last week and uh, to remember one time when she put it out there, uh, a story and then weighed in audience sort of participation. Uh, and that was a story that was published that I treasure that it was part of uh, a reading where she kind of asked us, you know, what do you think I should do? And we're never shy of opinions. So it was great. And I love the interactive quality. So I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to, you know, dash off because then we can chat without fear of our comments being on YouTube. So it has been a lovely evening. Bethany wanted to read, didn't she? Oh, I'm so sorry, Stephanie. Love to have you. Don't worry, I didn't manage to hit the recording. Well, I wasn't going to insist, but, oh, okay. but if Priscilla says, and there's time. Priscilla says, Bethany is reading. <laughs> Okay, so I'm really excited to share that my new book for Moonpath Press is out, The Pear Tree, and I thought um, I would read one poem from that. There, we, there is a Moonpath Zoom on December 3, and if anyone would like that Zoom link, they could contact me or Lana, who is here. So this is To Bless. My grandmother's pear tree shaded the path that led to the bee boxes. In late spring, a frenzy of blossoms white like a wedding. 
in late summer our barefoot dance bees baptized in fallen bodies of pears to bless comes from old english bledsian from northumbrian bloodsian druids in moonlight stones hallowed in blood the vestibule beyond our church's front doors had walls painted yellow as pollen yellow as our honey tasting of blossoms in church one blessing hum of hymns washed in the blood of the lamb on the path to the bees this blessing the pear tree limbs raised bursting with bees thank you thank you wonderful reading tonight peggy thank you so much that was so fun so great lana has put the the next the the link to the december 3rd reading in and as um some of you know already i'm i'm scheduling for um 2024 i know mary ellen challey is going to be here uh in march with the empty bowl uh i believe it's an anthology and anybody who has a new book or just wants to try out a new poem I love to kind of do scheduling in big bursts and get it all set for the future years. So contact me. Um, we're going to be uh, hearing from uh, Michelle Bombardier, Mary Pan, and Stephanie Cooper in December with the Northwest Narrative Medicine Group. And then in January, our civic poet, uh, Seattle civic poet Shin Yi Pai is leading off with one of her first poet Seattle, uh, City of Seattle uh, readings for the January reading. And uh, then I'm working on the whole rest of 2024. So if you know my name, just contact me there at Gmail and let's get your book for next year. And the open mic is always open. So love to have you all come back.